You know, if I asked you guys how many of you all, how many of you all want to live a life full of joy, how many of y'all would raise your hand? I mean, everybody here wants to live a life full of joy. Amen? But the reality is, is that joy seems to be like a, like jello in your hand. It seems to be elusive. And it seems like, well, when you really try getting your hands on it, it escapes you because it's like jello. It just seems to just slip away and get away from you. This series is about how do we make joy stick? How do we make joy to, to where joy becomes a permanent part of our life? Joy becomes a permanent feature in our lives. So on today, one of our children has a birthday. And so we normally do birthday weeks in our household. And so the person whose birthday it is, they've got no chores for that entire week. So this week, he's going to have plenty of joy, all right, because that means no dishes, no other stuff. So he'll have plenty of joy. But we all have joy like that, right? We all have joy periodically. We all have joy that seems to be intermittent. We all have joy that's every once in a while. But how do you take that joy that just shows up sometime, like on birthdays or holidays, um, after you get a promotion, how do you take joy that's like that to have joy every day? How many of y'all want to have joy as a regular feature of your life? And so we want to grow up, well, well, boy, we have joy that is a regular feature of our life. The question becomes, Pastor, what is joy? Joy, joy really means what it says. It means joy. It means gladness. It means um, the presence of a energetic jubilation. It means a disposition where you feel well, you're excited about life, you're, you're encouraged. It's, it's just joy, right? And so for the New Orleans Saints fan, as they beat the Cowboys, that feeling you had can be described and depicted as joy, all right? On the rerun, on the, on, the, on, the, on the rematch, when the Cowboys beat the Saints, then the Cowboys are going to have that feeling of joy. Smile at me, all right? But guys, what happens, guys? Too many of us, guys, we don't experience joy as an ongoing feature of our lives. Between biblical joy and typical joy. There's a difference between biblical joy and typical joy. So as a believer in Jesus Christ, your joy should have a different place of origin than a, than a non-believer who occasionally experiences joy. The level at which a believer experiences joy should be a different level from which those who don't know Christ experience joy. So I thought about this, you know, for, for many people, joy, joy is circumstantial. So if things are going well, I'm joyful. If, if, if I've got more money, things are joyful. If I get a new house, things are joyful. If I'm doing I'm well at work, I'm, I'm, I'm joyful. That is circumstantial joy. But for the believer, you ought to have Christological joy. You ought to have joy because you're in Jesus Christ. You ought to have joy because, because of your relationship with him. You ought to have joy that is not predicated upon things going well because you know Christ on the inside. Number two, biblical joy should be internal where typical joy is primarily external. In other words, the source of our joy as a believer ought to be our relationship with Christ, our spiritual depth, us knowing the truth about God and who God is and what God is up to. We ought to have joy because we're in Jesus Christ. Number three, um, biblical joy should be spiritual versus material. So what happens is typically we're joyful if our material world is well. So but if we got the bling bling, if we got something left after we pay the bills, then what we tend to be joyful. But our joy should not be predicated upon material things. And but there's nothing wrong with material things. Our joy should be put upon, uh, predicated upon our spiritual reality. Number four, for the believer, the joy should be perspectival and not behavioral. So watch this now. We often say, you know what? What can I do to be joyful? Well, as a believer in Christ, it's not what you do that makes you joyful. It's who you are that should make you joyful. Amen? And so um, as we look at that, um, the biblical joy versus typical joy, I want you all to go to the book of Philippians with me on today. We've got, we've got an example of somebody who was in a bad situation but still has joy. We've got an example of somebody who externally things are not going well, but he still got joy. We've got an example of somebody who's got an excuse not to be happy and joyful, yet and still he's happy and joyful. Amen? So I actually want to start a series today, and in this series, I'm going to do some serious preaching. 
Smile at me, all right? I'm doing some serious preaching in the series, all right? In the series, all right? So in the series, we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at joy. What, what, what Paul basically talks about in the book of Philippians is that he talks to us about joy. Um, our joy should not be predicated upon our circumstances, but our joy should not even be um, predicated upon our setting. You know, so often if our setting is right, then we have joy. But your joy should not be predicated upon your setting. Your joy should be predicated upon your mindset. Are we tracking together? So, boy, in the book of Philippians, one of the major themes is the mind. Do you have the mind of Christ? So, boy, it, it, it doesn't mean that as a believer in Christ, you don't have negative things that happen. You don't have bad things that happen. What it means is that, boy, in Christ as a believer, your mind is set. And because you have the proper mindset, you can properly process what you experience, what you go through, what you hear, and what you see. Are we tracking together? So when you come to Philippians in chapter 1, according to Warren Wiersbe, he talks about the single mind. In chapter 2, he talks about the submitted mind. In chapter 3, he talks about the spiritual mind. And in chapter 4, he talks about the secure mind. In chapter 1, he says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Is that not a perspective of what? To live is Christ and to die is gain. In chapter 2, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so, but what is your mindset? In chapter 3, it says, um, it says, it's not that I have already obtained, but, but boy, I pursue, I seek after the, the, the prize of the high mark, the high calling in Jesus Christ. In chapter 4, it says that my God is able to supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. That's a secure mind. So, boy, chapter 1 says a single mind. Chapter 2 says a submitted mind. Chapter 3 says a spiritual mind. Chapter 4 says a secure mind. What is your mindset like in Jesus Christ? So, for many of us, here's the key, guys. We allow our circumstances to dictate, to, um, dictate our joy rather than our perspective and our mind in Christ to determine and dictate our joy. Amen? So, we want to be, a, um, we want to be people who can make joy stick in our lives. In Philippians chapter 1 verses 1 through 11, what he tells us here, he tells us that well, we can find joy in faith-filled fellowship. I'm going to share with you guys over the next few, I'm going to share with you guys nine or ten places that where, where boy, you can find joy or where joy can show up in your life. Amen? Um, Philippians chapter 1 verse 1 says this, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you all are partakers with, with me of grace both in my imprisonment and defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. It is my prayer that you love that your love may abound more and more with all knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want to put an emphasis on verse 5. Verse 5 says this. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So when you come and you look at these verses, basically um, the scholars suggest this is one of Paul's most, most, um, most loving and affectionate letters. Um, by structure that will um, bear out to be true because typically when you read the um, books that Paul wrote to churches like the book of Romans, the book of Colossians, um, the book of um, the two books in Corinthians, typically what happens is Paul talks about, talks about doctrine first and then in the second half he talks about duty. So he typically talks about orthodoxy in the first half of his writing, then he talks about orthoproxy in the second half of his writing. But here it's not so. When you come into this book, what Paul talks about, it's not doctrinal per se. Um, he, um, what, what Paul emphasizes is, is boy, a relational understanding. He talks about how he feels about the people he's serving. How many of y'all have views about the church and what the church ought to be about? 
And so what happens, when we think about church today, we typically think about a transaction. So you know what, I'm going to go to church on Sunday, somebody's going to sing, some people are going to sing, somebody's going to preach, they may greet me, they're going to keep my kids for an hour and give me a break, and I'm going to give a little small offering, and then I'm going to go home, and what we call that church. And the reality is that, boy, that is part of the Christian experience, but it falls far short of what God intends for his church to be. And when you come to Philippians chapter 1, what Paul is saying, you know what? I want you all to find joy in your relationship with the ministers, the members, and the mission of the church. Have you ever thought about, boy, that the church ought to be a place of encouragement, the place ought to be a place of joy? Not what transpires as far as a worship service, but your experience with the ministers, your experience with the members, and your experience and engagement of biblical mission. You ought to find joy in that. Amen? So what Paul argues here is that Paul, what Paul would argue, Paul comes and expresses how he feels about this church at Philippi. Paul was involved with, um, with, with starting this church in the book of Acts, I think chapter 18, chapter 16. Paul talks about how, how boy, he helped start this church. He was, the, quote, unquote, the founding pastor of the church at Philippi. He talked about how boy, he helped form their faith, and now they're in partnership together, and how he feels about them and how they feel about him. So when you talk about your church and you talk about being part of a church, is it transactional or is it transformational? Is it 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 relational or is it reputational? I think I just made up a word right there, but it sounds good, don't it? <laughs> reputational, all right. So watch this now. So often when we talk about church, we don't talk about the elements and the ingredients that should be a part of a church that makes a church a heartfelt church. And so what Paul describes to us, he gives us five elements of a faith-filled church. How many of y'all want to have joy? You know what? Your, the, the place you call home when it comes to church ought to be a place of joy, a place of encouragement, a place where you know what? You go and you are spiritually vitalized, not because of a preacher, but because of the dynamics and the relationship that you encounter in that church. Amen? First thing he shows us is organization among gospel partners. You know, so often we talk about church and we talk about it being an organization rather than it being an organism. And so we often think when it comes to church, you ought to lose all structure. You ought to lose all, all, all order. But the reality is you should not lose structure when you come to a church. And both organization and structure and hierarchy doesn't make a negative place. In verse 1 and 2, what you see is he makes reference to organization, the church. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now watch this now. Um, Timothy probably was with him, but Timothy probably was not the author of the ideas. He probably was his um, emanuenses or his secretary, his administrative assistant who kind of wrote out what Paul was thinking. And then he says that, boy, we are servants. In some versions it says prisoners of Christ Jesus. Notice the word order here. It doesn't say Jesus Christ. It says Christ Jesus. It says Christ Jesus because it's emphasizing the lordship of Christ, the deity of Christ. It means that God is in charge. Amen? And then he says to all the New Orleans saints in Christ Jesus. <laughs> is, is, is that what he says? <laughs> he says to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Now watch this now. He says to all the saints. Saints, saints, saints is not what you, uh, um, it's not what you behave to become. To be a saint means that, boy, God has designated you one whom, whom is set apart. The word saint, from Greek term hagios, it means the, the one or the ones who are set apart for God's purposes. So to be a saint means that, boy, you are set apart for God's purposes. And what God says here, um, 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 Paul is writing to those who've been set apart in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Why does he say in Christ Jesus? Because it's not just those who live in the same geographic area. It's those who have believed in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now Jesus Christ is their Lord. Amen? And so he says, here, this is who I'm writing to. So in, in typical format, typical um, um, framing, when you have a um, New Testament um, book, uh, what you typically have is you have the people who are the author of the book, you have the audience of the book, and then you typically get a, um, a prayer wish for the people who are there. And so Paul says, here's the, here's the health wish, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. So he comes and he says, boy, grace to you. In other words, grace is God giving you what you don't deserve. How many of you all recognize that God has given you what you don't deserve? 
Amen. And so, boy, to be able to live, to act, uh, to function, to live where you live, to do what you do, to be an American and not to be in Syria right now, being bombed and taken over by, by, by another country. God has even sovereignly blessed you to live where you live right now. And so it says grace and peace. Now, boy, peace means, peace means things are well. Peace does not um, necessarily mean there's no warfare. It doesn't necessarily mean there's no hostility. But peace has the idea of the, of the, of the, of the presence of decorum, the presence of, 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 of knowing that, you know what, even if there's danger, you are somewhat insulated from the danger. Um, peace is the presence of, of good welfare. And so he says, here, grace and peace to you. Now, um, one writer says that, boy, you, you always see when grace and peace are together, grace comes first. Watch this now. You cannot have peace without experiencing the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And so no matter how well things are on earth, if you don't have your eternity intact, you don't have ultimate peace. So what we see is we see order, order and organization here in this first verse. He, he makes reference to overseers and deacons. And so the term overseer comes from the Greek term episkopos. It means the one who, who, who helps to manage things, to help keep things in order. Deacons here comes from the Greek term diakonoi. It's plural. The word deacon here, deacon is not the person who determines if the pastor gets to stay or get fired. All right. Deacons the, doesn't mean the one who kind of signs off on checks. Deacons are not the ones who, who boy, they're the police in the congregation. All right. Um, the Greek term deacons means one who serves, one who has strong character and services the purposes and the work of God. Amen. And so watch, and watch, watch this now. In the era that we live in, we frown upon any type of hierarchy and any type of order. But what you see here in this church that was joy filled, they had order. First, I mean, um, first um, 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 Romans 14, no, First Corinthians 14 makes reference to let all things be decent and in order. Are we tracking together? So guys, we ought to have an orderly church. And boy, that's, a, that's, a, that's an element of a faith-filled Georgia. Number two is coordination um, and contribution among gospel partners. Y'all still with me? Look at verse five. Because of your partnership in the gospel, from the first day until now. When he comes in verse 5 and he says, for your partnership in the gospel, um, it comes from the Greek term called kononia. So y'all heard the term kononia, right? Okay. Well, I just said it. So y'all heard the word kononia, right? All right. <laughs> okay, you just heard it, right? So but it means fellowship, all right? So but it means fellowship. But, but, but you know, I don't want to emphasize the word fellowship because when we know we hear fellowship, what we hear is food. When we hear fellowship, what we hear is festivity. When we hear fellowship, what we hear is fun. And but all those things should be entailed, but it's so much more into this term where it says partnership, this, um, this, this term kononia, is so much more to this biblical fellowship than just talking about having fun together at an event. You know, when I was in college, I was part of a fraternity. And boy, being part of that fraternity, no matter where I went in the country, I, I, I can get a phone number and a connection. And boy, if, if, if I, I call the right person, we would have fun, we would have food, and we would have fellowship together. But boy, watch this now. That was an organizational experience of fellowship. You know, some of you all are in fraternal organizations, and boy, you have that. Some of you all are in um, business clubs and, and rotary clubs, and boy, you all have connections and associations. I've got a group me stream of my old basketball players who I played ball with, and we have some kinship. We had something in common. But guys, all these organizations should pale in comparison to the relationships that you have in Jesus Christ. You know, boy, church is not just about coming to church. Church is about relationships. It's about, it's, about, it's about sharing some things in common. So in Christ, Paul was saying, you know what? Number one, we got the same Messiah and Savior in common. Number two, we have the same message in common. That's the, that's the gospel of Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. We have the same message. Number three, we have the same mission. Our goal is to help expand Christ's message all throughout the world. It's to bring light to dark places. It's to bring hope to areas that are hopeless. It's to bring love to where there is no love. It's to bring encouragement where there's discouragement. It's to bring glue where people cannot be unified and stick together. We are part of that band of believers called Christ followers amen? amen 
And but we believe in it so much that, boy, we give, we give money towards what we believe in it. But what we're trying to do, Paul's relationship in part was, was sustained by them partnering with him financially in the ministry that God had called him to do. Amen? So they, they shared these things in common. They had a common message. They had a common Messiah. They had a common ministry. They wanted to go and expand the gospel. They had a common place where they gave their money. But they also had a common experience of the Holy Spirit. You know, when you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it's not like a fraternity. It's not like a business club. It's not like, it's not like the UAW workers. You have a blood-bought, blood-purchased, Holy Spirit-sustained relationship that is not primarily visible, but invisible because of the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen? Amen. And, so, and so he says, you know what, I'm, guys, I'm just so thankful for your partnership. And boy, he says, you know what? I have you in my heart. Every time I pray, I think about you. Because boy, Paul has this heartfelt experience about the people whom he's in partnership with. There's, 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 there's something great about when people and parishioner, minister and minister, are in line, um, um, aligned together to make a difference for Christ. You know, so often today, we don't think about that kind of thing we think about church, do we? We don't think about, we don't think about, you know what, what kind of relationship should we have? We think about music, we think about facilities, we think about, we think about style, we think about reputation. But, but do you think about the dynamic that should be transpiring between the ministers of the church and the members of the church? And but what should be transpiring in our midst and what that should be a source of encouragement for us? And so but the first thing he talks about here, the first element is organization. The second element is coordination. We're, we're on mission together. How many of y'all know about we on mission together here? All righty, guys. Guys, we're not just here to come to church on Sunday. We're here on mission together. He goes on and he talks about transformation in verse 6, transformation among gospel partners. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He says, guys, you know what, guys? One of the dynamics that happens um, in a joy, faith-filled fellowship is that now we all are experiencing the transformation of Christ. You know, in one of our documents, we talked about vision. We talked about um, we want to be a place where transformation is the norm and not the exception. You know what? Wouldn't it be dynamic to be part of a place where people were being transformed by the power of God, by the word of God, by the spirit of God? You know, what happens is we're so busy trying to cover up what we messed up that, well, we don't want to testify when God brings us through because it's going to reveal where we were. And boy, not being able to reveal where you were, you don't get a chance to testify that God is the reason you are where you are. Are we tracking together? Can you testify to what God has done? Like how, how boy, God has, has, has brought you from immaturity to maturity. How God has brought, has brought you from brokenness to wholeness. How, how God turned your marriage around from being jacked up to being something that shows up. Can you testify to what God has done for you? So often, guys, we're ashamed to say where we were to where God has brought us to right now. And boy, the Bible says in Revelation, that boy, we overcame them by the word of our testimony. How many of you are willing to testify about God's transforming power? You know, so um, y'all don't even want to clap about it, huh? Um, how God has transformed. You know what? It's a tragedy and a shame when you can't point to where God has transformed you recently. That means that your walk with God is dated. That means that your walk with God is not, is not presently vital because God wants to take us from faith to faith and glory to glory. God wants to continue molding us and shaping us and developing us and expanding us and purifying us and cleaning us and preparing us and using us. God does not, who, who cannot get encouraged by knowing that God is still at work? Amen. God is still at work trying to mold us and to develop us and to deploy us for his purposes. The good news today is I'm not where I was yesterday and I'm not where I will be tomorrow. That's good news, isn't it? If that can't encourage you, your wood is wet. <laughs> That's what the old folks say, right? <laughs> It's the transformation. He says, he says here, he says, he says, he says, and I am sure of this, he who begin a good work in you will bring it to completion. In other words, God's not going to give up on you. God's not going to throw in the towel. God's not going to abandon the mission. 
God's not going to conclude that you're a mess, you've been a mess, you're going to be a mess, and you are a mess. That is not God's conclusion. God's conclusion is this. I'm still at work in your life. You're a mess. And boy, you got some rough edges, but I'm still working with you. And if I can give sight to the blind, I can feed 5,000, I can sling light into existence, I can distinguish between night and day, surely I can transform your life and your situation. Isn't that good news? That, boy, God is transforming us who are part of him. Look at verse 7 and verse 8, and, you boy, you see the affection among gospel people, gospel partners. It is, it is right for me to feel this way about you all. Paul said, you know what? It's, it's right for me to feel this way. Now, boy, Paul didn't feel this way about all his churches. He didn't say this to the church at Corinth. Them heathens. Smile at me, all right? Because I hold you in my heart. He says in verse 3, I thank my God for you. In verse 6, it says, I am sure of this. In verse 7, it says, I, I hold you in my heart. In verse 8, he says, I yearn for you. You know, but it, isn't that a great message to hear from the past of the church? I have you in my heart. I'm always making mention of you. Um, I'm sure God is at work. I yearn to be around you. Isn't it encouraging to be around somebody who's excited about you? Now, what's interesting, he's not talking about just one person primarily. He's talking about, you know what, the leadership of the church is excited about the membership of the church. Amen. You know what, boy, you're part of a church where, boy, I, I think extremely favorably about our church. And so if somebody asks me about our church, you know, take what I say, you know, we got a great church. The, uh, the thing that's worse than our church is the pastor. If I can get them a pastor, who can be better? They'd be all right. You know what, I'm excited about our church, you know, I, I'm excited because like, you know what, I'm, I recall personally how I get to, my wife, how we get to be, be part of a church, not only that we're a blessing to, but we've been blessed by our congregation. So well, we've had four babies, I think we've been, since we've been four or five babies, and boy, each time our congregation has been loving towards us. Our daughter almost died in 2016. We spent 17 consecutive days at the hospital, and our church came and, boy, took care of our kids to the point where we weren't worried about our kids at home because of our church members who were loving on us. You know, guys, it's stuff like that that makes me just love our congregation. You know, boy, we're not a church that's full of drama. You know, they say, they say the drama ministry is the largest ministry in most churches. <laughs> just full of drama, right? We don't do a whole lot of drama. Now, boy, you have life that happens at church, right? But, boy, we don't do a bunch of drama at our church. Are we tracking together? You ain't got people who fussing and fighting all the time. But, oh, boy, you have folks who disagree, but, boy, we're not characterized by strife. Are we tracking together? So, boy, well, so, boy when I come to church, I know, well, but we, we got a unified church. We got people trying to grow. We got people who got stuff going on. But, but we have a loving congregation. I received a letter, um, a note on yesterday from one of our church members, and um, she was just, um, she was here for a while, and um, she moved to Las Vegas, and um, in going to Las Vegas, um, she was moving, she was older, she moved here with her mom, and, um, and, and what she did was she just recently moved to Las Vegas, I'm trying to pull her email up, and so yesterday I was um, at, the, um, at the basketball court waiting on my kids to get finished hooping because you know I still can talk about it I just can't do it as well no more so I sent them inside to play when I was in the car all right and so um so they were there playing so boy this this note came across my phone on yesterday and she was just sharing with me um and a a boy update on boy how she was doing it and on what was transpiring and boy how much the destiny church had blessed her um as she transitioned from here going to Las Vegas y'all good he, she said, Pastor, um, hello, it's Gwen. Sorry it takes so long to communicate with you. She's only been gone two weeks. Um, <laughs> um, but things are moving at a very fast pace for me since leaving Texas. I want you to know that I had so much help and assistance from the men at the church. I thank God for them. And then she names them. They loaded up my pod to move my furniture to um, Vegas. Um, Aaron took uh, my, my Spectrum cable. I ain't no Spectrum was still around. How many of y'all use Spectrum, all right? Uh, she said, I took my Spectrum cable equipment back from me so I didn't have to. Um, th this person bought my automobile on the spot um, in cash and, and, and then let me keep it for two weeks so I could get around while I was still here in town. Now, if that ain't God blessing me, I don't know what is. I also used one of the members to drive my furnishings here, um, pulling my daughter's car to Las Vegas. He did a wonderful job, and I would highly recommend him to anyone for a job well done. He's a wonderful gentleman, and thanks for the recommendation. 
Are we tracking together, guys? So, guys, that's the first paragraph of four. Her last one says, give my best to everyone. Kiss the first lady. I got to kiss you. Um, kiss the first lady. It ain't my kiss. It's, she want me to kiss you. And so, um, all right, kiss the first lady for me and tell her I miss her. I will keep in touch. And, of course, it goes without saying, I miss all of you, and I love you all a lot. Jesus is Lord. Amen. That's the kind of church we have. It's not just about the walls. It's not just about the music. It's not just about a personality preaching. It's about a relational fabric and love for one another because we all are in the body of Christ and we have the same message. We have the same Messiah. We have the same ministry. We have the same mission. And we all give our funds and resources towards advancing the kingdom of God. Amen? I can tell you story after story in this congregation where people have spontaneously loved on one another because of the relationships that take place in our congregation. Now, boy, you should have good doctrine, and boy, you should worship God purely, and you should be on mission, but don't miss one of the critical elements is the affection that believers have for one another in the body of Christ. She's been gone for two weeks and apologizing for not getting in touch sooner. You think her membership meant something to her? You think the fellowship meant something for her? You think she was touched relationally? in this congregation. And so, boy, Paul says here, Paul says, you know what? I've got affection for you. When you think about your church, you know what? The leadership there really cares for me. You know, I do this thing called a weekly report um, with our leaders and boy, every week they're supposed to turn the support in. Then I, they don't, but, but it, they're supposed to. And so, um, but the first question on the report, and what we do online, the first question on the report basically comes down to pastoral care issue. How are the people in your ministry area doing? I want to know, boy, number one, have you contacted the people in your ministry area? Because, boy, where there's no contact, there can be no impact. And so, boy, how do people... See, boy, at a good church, it's not just about one pastor taking care of everybody. It's about people taking care of one another. Are we tracking together? And so, boy, once you get past about five or ten people, it's hard for somebody to keep up with everybody in the church. But, boy, is everybody in the church being kept up with? Are we tracking together? And so it's, it's, it's this whole idea of these relationships and, and being connected. He says here in verse 7, he says, it is right for me to feel this way about you all. I love the church I pastor. I love being around you all. It's not, it's not a burden to be around you all. It's not a challenge. Around. I don't go around, you know what, I say nice things to you, but behind your back I got all kind of negative things to say about you, them folks. You know what, I wish people had the privilege of pastoring a church like I pastor. To boy, 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 people are at peace, people are productive, people are not arguing and fighting, people are supportive, people are encouraging, people love one another. Amen? He said, because I hold you in my heart, for you all are partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. What's interesting here is that, boy, you would think Paul was writing from Maui. You would think Paul was writing from a cruise. You would think Paul was writing from his favorite, his um, his 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 boy favorite, his favorite hotel in Europe. No, no, no. Paul is writing from a dingy, cold dungeon called the prison. How can he be so encouraging from prison? How can he be so enlightening from prison? How can he be so joyful from prison? Now, boy, I ain't trying to be funny or snarky with nobody, but um, I never had anybody who was close to me who was in prison who wrote me a letter. Okay. And so, boy, um, but I doubt if they wrote me a letter, it would be this encouraging, this inspiring, this joyful, because typically you don't want to be in prison, right? He's in jail, but he's got joy. Amen. So, but this is, what, this is one of, one of, of what you call his prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Philemon, and Colossians. The, these are letters that Paul wrote when he was in the most uncomfortable circumstances that could be around at that point in time. He was in prison for something he did not do. Are we tracking together? And so, guys, watch this now. He's there, and, boy, he's, he's in prison. He's writing these encouraging words because, boy, he misses the fellowship. He misses the membership. He misses the people who know Christ, who he can't hang out with. Do you miss the people you hang out with at church? Do you miss being connected by the blood of Christ? Do you miss people who have that commonality of ministry and mission and Messiah and message? Do you miss being around people of God? If not, you've got to get more connected. He talks here about, 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 about his affection. Lastly, he talks about intercession for gospel partners. In verses 3 and 4, in verses 9 through 11, what you see, you get a chance to peek in on a prayer that Paul has for his parishioners. 
In verse 3, it says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all are making my prayer with joy. Watch this now. What's Paul saying? Paul, you know what? Every time I go before God, I think about you. Every time I pray, I think about you. And then in verses 9 through 11, he gives the content of what he prayed. How many of y'all would be encouraged if you knew somebody was praying for you all the time? My wife and I, we've got a lady who's been praying for us for 26 years. She's been praying for us for 26 years. What kind of confidence are you drawing knowing that, you know what, the people at the church, they're praying for me. When they gather for a meeting, they, they aren't just looking at numbers. They, they're praying for people. They're praying for us. And so, what, 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 what is it? so, so, so boy, what did Paul pray for? Them? Number one, Paul prayed for their spiritual devotion. Verse 9. You guys good? It's my prayer that your, that your love may abound more and more with all knowledge and discernment. The first thing Paul prayed for, but they grow in their spiritual devotion. He said, you know what? I want to pray that your love grow more and more. And so watch this now. I know you love people. I know you do what's in the best interest of others. But guys, you know what? I want to see you at destiny. I want to see you all grow more in your love. I want to see you all deepen your relationships. I want to see you all have greater devotion to my mission, to my purpose. Um, I want to see your love abound more and more. Number two, he prays for greater spiritual discernment. He says here that, that, um, um, that your love may abound more and more with love, with knowledge, and all discernment. Now, watch this now. God says, you know what? I want you to pray with greater discernment, verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent. Watch now what he's saying. He's, he's saying, guys, what I'm praying for you all is that, boy, I'm praying God helps you to make better decisions. I'm praying that God will give you great discernment. You know, as you become a believer and you grow in Christ, it's no longer about just what's right and wrong. You're trying to think between what's better and what's best. And so I'm not just trying to make a good decision. I'm trying to make the best decision I can make. And Paul, you know what? I'm praying for your spiritual discernment. The term he uses here, he uses the term, he says approve. This is um, dokimazo in the Greek. And what it means that, boy, you're able to affirm, you're able to recognize, you can resonate with, with, with the direction that God wants you to go in. How many of y'all have to make decisions? How many of y'all want to make good decisions? And but watch this now. How many of you all struggle sometimes in decision making because many times the options are not per se bad options. The question becomes, what's the better option and what's the best option? And so Paul is praying for their spiritual discernment. He's praying that they can approve those things which are excellent. Number three, what he prays for is their spiritual development. He says in verse 9, it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. You know what he's saying? You know, you know what? I want you all to continue to grow spiritually. See, guys, in the Christian life, it's not just about um, staying out of jail. It's not just about, you know what? Well, I'm going to heaven now, so everything else, you know, it's, um, it's trivial. No, what he wants to know is when you get to heaven, will you look just like Jesus Christ? Will your character be just like his character? Because, boy, here's what, the, here's what the pundits say. If you know you're going to heaven, then why live a holy life? If you know you're going to heaven, why do all that Bible reading? Why do all that Bible studying? And, boy, why go for those meetings? And why get involved in ministry? And why have a meditation time? And why serve others? Why give your money to that? If you know you're going to heaven already, you do it because God's goal is for you to be fully conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That means your character and your conduct represents Jesus Christ 100% of the time. That's the goal. Amen. He wants to see you be pure and blameless. Amen? There's a confidence that comes with living a holy life. There's a joy that comes with, you know what, I'm suffering, and it's not because anything I've done wrong, but I'm suffering for righteousness in Jesus Christ. I was meeting with somebody in between um, this service and the last service. And boy, they're kind of in a valley situation right now. I was saying, you know what? Just keep walking in faith. Just keep obeying God and just keep trusting God. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know when you live for God, God makes it happen. Amen? Amen. And then lastly, he, played, he prayed for their spiritual deployment, verse 11. It says, filled with the fruit of righteousness. This word filled here, filled is not talking about the amount. I mean, how do you measure righteousness? So, but he's not talking about something that you measure in fluid. He's talking about being controlled with the fruit of righteousness 
that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So when you're pure and you're blameless, um, what comes out of your life is righteousness. Are we tracking together? And so he says, so you know what? Um, they come from to the glory and praise of God. He prays for their spiritual devotion. He prays, he, he prays for their spiritual discernment. He prays for their spiritual development. He prays for their spiritual deployment. Who cannot find joy in that kind of congregation? You know, guys, we got some things we got to work on. But guys, I'll tell you one thing, guys, I think we do well. When you come to Destiny Church and you get connected, we're not perfect. But I can promise you, when you get connected here, it's going to be some people who are going to love on you, who are going to care for you, who are going to be there for you when you don't even expect them to be there for you. Now, I was in a fraternity, and boy, you know what? Sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes level to the ground. Sometimes they answer the phone, sometimes they don't. My old neighbor posted something on Facebook. I can't say all of it because she wasn't spirit-filled when she wrote it. <laughs> but she said something like this, that people always tell you to call them if you need them. And when you call them, they don't answer the blankety-blank phone. <laughs> I didn't say it. Don't, don't even struggle. You put wait, 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 wait. Isn't that true, though? People, people say one thing but do something else. Yes. And so we want to be the congregation that, guys, you, you can look forward to somebody loving on you, somebody caring for you, somebody teaching you God's word, somebody giving you the whole counsel of God, not just parts of it. Somebody help you to have the proper mindset. It's not your setting. It's your mindset. It's not what happens to you. It's how you process what happens to you. You can have joy even if you're imprisoned. Yes. And so Paul says, hey, you know what, I'm in, I'm in, you know what, the prison, um, I'm, I'm in prison, but the prison is not in me. So boy, can you have joy? Now, I was thinking about this. One of our members is here at church today, and um, she was in the hospital. I'll share what you got about her, about, 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 about her situation. And, um, and boy, she's on the other side of her, of her, um, of her syndrome. She had um, Goulian Barry, something like that, GB. She had Goulian Barry. And boy, she got out of church, I mean, out of the hospital, not this Thursday, but last Thursday. I understand that one of the first places she wanted to go was not to Chuck E. Cheese, not to Chick fil A. She wanted to come to church. Why did she want to come to church? Because you guys were to church. Because you guys were loving, you guys were caring, you guys have visited, you guys have supported, and we're going to continue to do that, amen? That's what church should be out. Church is not primarily an organization, but it is an organization. It's primarily an organism. And when you get connected to the right kind of church, not just the building, not just the income, not just the song, not just the preacher, but the people and the mission, then, boy, that, that, that should be a source of joy for you, Amen? So my prayer is that you can find joy in a faith-filled fellowship. So if you're here on the day, and boy, you haven't connected with us, I want to give you an invitation to fill a connection card out and get connected with us. We're not perfect, but boy, we strive to be all that Christ wants us to be. Amen? Amen. If you're here, boy, you haven't trusted Christ, grace and peace. You can't have peace until you experience God's grace by trusting him for salvation. If you're here and you haven't trusted Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, this is not a game. And I've been sharing with you guys week after week that you know what? People are dying for the first time every day. And people are dying younger and younger. Last Saturday, about 2 o'clock in the morning, there was a 28-year-old girl at home playing with her nephew and ended up leaving this world. She wasn't in the street. She wasn't doing anything crazy. She was married her own business, having a good time with her nephew, and ended up facing eternity. Not trying to threaten you. Not trying to scare you. I do want you to make a decision to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior if you have not done so. Now I want to ask you to complete that connection card that's at your seat today. That's the first step you take on this journey of joy that's placing your faith in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. God bless you.